It would seem common, and perhaps even understandable, that most people think about immigration from the perspective of their own country. Unless we are directly connected to it, we rarely understand the movement of people around the globe or the experiences of the world's many diasporas. To bring a greater insight to such experiences, today I want to share two books that look deep into the artist's own family histories of immigration and subsequent exile and imprisonment. Lesia Marischak uses photography, books, film, and more to share narratives about the land, histories of colonized peoples, and the personal and cultural ramifications of exile. She is a Canadian artist of Ukrainian descent. Her great-grandparents immigrated in 1896. Mariushak describes this land, Anna's Journal of Migration and Internment, as a window into a world of migration and trauma and the legacy of the immigrant dream. Like a carefully assembled scrapbook, this land relates the story of Anna, a fictional heroine Mariushak created to convey the experiences of Ukrainian immigrants to Canada and their subsequent nationally mandated exile and incarceration during and after World War I. The text running through the book is in the form of letters Anna writes to her mother back in Ukraine. In the late 19th century, Canada had encouraged immigrants to move to the country, promising them 160 acres in the Canadian prairies. There is great hardship for the recently arrived, but they are surviving. Then war is declared. Fears over national security, alongside wartime prejudice, led the Canadian government to turn against the Ukrainian immigrant population, the very same people they had promised land to only a few years prior. The Canadian government moved the so-called enemy aliens into 24 incarceration camps and receiving stations across the country. The government imprisoned over 8,000 Ukrainian men, women, and children, those of Ukrainian citizenship, as well as naturalized Canadians of Ukrainian descent. Anna's letters tell of the hardship and fear and the struggles faced by the displaced immigrants building their own incarceration camps without proper clothes, shoes, or provisions. Marushak spent many hours in archives researching and collecting historic documents about the Ukrainian-Canadian incarceration. These artifacts, some represented as is, and some reinterpreted, explain an official story. Anna's voice brings us humanity, fear, and fortitude. I always stop here for a moment, lingering in the complexity of hardship, beauty, survival, and dreaming. Conditions in the camp don't improve, and men try to escape, only to be shot. They are treated like animals and forced into labor. The war finally ends, and the camps begin closing. But of course, the nation does not easily welcome the Ukrainian Canadians back. They were imprisoned for two further years after the war ended. The government and population continued to treat the Ukrainian Canadians as criminals, even calling for their deportation. The materials of this land and their provenance are very important to Maroshak. For example, this image of the Spirit Lake internment camp was printed on paper made partially of sheep's wool. Maroshak chose this paper 
because the early Ukrainian immigrants to Canada, like her own relatives, were known as the people of the sheepskin coats. Mariushek also used paper made in Japan to reference the later incarceration of Japanese Canadians during World War II. As Anna's story closes, she asks where this will end, what the future holds for them. The final image is a reproduction of a drawing that Mariushek herself made as an elementary school student in Canada, three generations after her great-grandparents arrived from Ukraine. Included in this variant edition of Mariushak's book are a photogravure and negative of all for 160 acres of land, an Austro-Hungarian passport, a fragment of a vintage child's garment from Ukraine, and a war tax stamp. Just like the tactile scrapbook feel of this land, these objects bring Anna's fictional story into our real world and history. This land is a thorough and engrossing presentation of research, history, and Marushak's artistry made personal through a tangible form. It is a testimony of the atrocities forced on a group of immigrants caught in the net of war and geopolitical hostility. Marushak was finishing this book as Ukraine was invaded by Russia in February 2022. This land with its storytelling through intimate lived experience, manifests a narrative that is more resonant now than ever. Yevgenia Kim works in printmaking, book arts, and installation to address ideas of identity and diaspora in a globalized present. Her work also examines the effects of forced migration on the individual. Koryo Saram collects these ideas in a personal and universal narrative. Kim is interested in textiles and the patterns in traditional clothes, furniture, and objects that surround people. The patterns on the box and this printed silk are Kim's interpretation of Korean designs. The accordion format gives Koryo Saram the sensibilities of both a codex and a scroll. You can read through page by page, or you can open the entire 24-foot accordion and walk the distance of the front and back to experience the book. The first side of the book is a visual story. Red stitching carries us across the pages. Initially, there are a few rectangles, like spaces on a family tree. The imagery is focused, and I can sense the shift in the landscape and the movement of this person carrying their bundle. This changed landscape is flatter and more desolate. The red stitching continues, passing through an image of war and relocation. More movement of people. Perhaps there's finally some stability for the immigrants as they farm, successfully bringing agriculture and growth to this desolate place. Up to this point, I understood this as a story of immigration, but until I saw Lenin, I had not realized we are under Soviet Russia. The thread marches on, passing through a page that suggests further assimilation of the Korean immigrants in language and culture. On the reverse side of the accordion book, Kim elaborates on the story of her own Korean ancestors' migration and assimilation into the Soviet Union. She shares an impactful point, that the family stories she grew up with don't quite match each other. This incongruity led her to examine the concept of how one defines the loss of ethnic identity. Kim goes on to explain in broad strokes the history of Korean immigration to Russia, beginning in the mid-1800s and increasing in the early 20th century. As I read the text, I frequently flipped back to the other side, finding more detail and context for the images. Kim elaborates on the political repression and ethnic cleansing 
that led to the deportation and resettlement of Soviet Koreans into Kazakhstan and Uzbekistan. As we saw for the Ukrainian immigrants to Canada in Marushak's This Land, and as we have seen time and again throughout history, countless people died on the journey as they were exiled into desolate outposts with few resources to survive. Kim explains the adaptation required by each generation of the Korean diaspora. They had to adapt again and again to ever-changing ecological, economic, and socio-cultural conditions. It was important to Kim to make Koryo Saram speak to both a personal and universal immigrant story. By separating the images and text, she is able to share the specifics of her family's story in the written narrative, while allowing the imagery the space to represent a larger story that other immigrants can relate to and see themselves in. I was particularly moved at the end of Kim's text narrative, where she clearly outlines the importance of understanding generational history. As part of the fourth generation of Koryo Saram, it is important to learn about my own history so that I am not defined by others, so that I can resist other people's images of my past and consequently my future. This land and Koryo Saram hold important space for Ukrainian Canadian and post-Soviet Korean identities. As part of the diaspora, or as governments and individuals welcoming immigrants into our shared space, we must acknowledge how migration, forced incarceration, and exile impacts individuals across generations. I am grateful when artists like Marusha and Kim expand on their family histories and then share this work with us through their own creativity and art. Their specific stories speak to universal experiences that will continue to happen unless we actively take part in dismantling it.